Okay, good morning. I think we'll go ahead and, and get started. Um, my name is Jennifer Presthold. I'm the Deputy Director of the Advocates for Human Rights, um, and I'd like to welcome you all and start out by saying thank you to um, Dorsey and Whitney, who the law firm that's hosting us today. Uh, we really appreciate um, the, the, the breakfast and the opportunity to um, provide this uh, continuing legal education training, um, but we also especially appreciate the technology that allows us to um, allowed us to invite um, some of our partners from around the world to participate. Um, right now, today, we are expecting to be joined by um, human rights defenders in, who are working on death penalty issues in Cameroon, Tanzania, Sierra Leone, Nigeria, Liberia, and Mauritania, as well as France and Switzerland. So I'd like to welcome all of you who are uh, participating by telephone. Um, a couple of sort of ground rules. Um, for one, those of you who are participating by telephone, I'd like to ask you to mute your microphone. Um, with an open line, we can hear things that are coming through on the other hand and, and the, on the other line, and that can be a, a little bit distracting. So please put your, um, put your telephone on mute until we get to the, the question and answer session at the end of the, at the, end of the training. Um, for those of you who are in the room, just a couple of things. We have a sign-up sheet for CLE credit on the desk, so please do, please do make sure that you sign your name on that so that you can get CLE credit. Um, this is a two-hour session, so we're going to go straight through, but if you need to take a break and use the restroom, they are out the door um, and just down the hall that way. Um, so I think that's it for sort of the, uh, the general information. Um, we're here today to talk about advocacy at the United Nations and specifically about the Universal Periodic Review death penalty and uh, review mechanism and how we can use that to advocate against the death penalty. Um, so I'm going to start just by giving you a little bit of an overview of the um, United Nations mechanisms and, and talk a bit about um, how civil society organizations like the Advocates for Human Rights use this to advocate against the death penalty um, and other human rights issues. And then we're going to sort of um, go a little bit deeper, and Amy Berquist, Berquist my colleague, is going to talk about um, really the mechanics of how you write a, a um, stakeholder submission to the Universal Periodic Review at the, um, at the United Nations. And then Rose Park, my other colleague, will be talking um, even more specifically about the death penalty and the international law related to the death penalty and, and the issues that we try to highlight in, um, in using the Universal Periodic Review mechanism. So let me start out by just giving you a little bit of, um, of an overview of the Advocates for Human Rights. For those of you who are not familiar with us, we were established in 1983 here in the Twin Cities, um, established by a, a small group of lawyers who believed that even though they were based in the middle of the United States, they could make change um, in, both in our community and internationally. And so we've been doing that now for more than, more than 30 years. Um, and we work to implement international human rights standards in order to promote civil society and reinforce the rule of law. And we've been working on death penalty issues since the, um, since the, the early 1990s. We um, are what's called a non-governmental organization in international terms, or an NGO, so you'll hear us make references to NGO. Um, there's a lot of acronym, um, acronyms in the United Nations system, um, and, uh, but, but that's one that gets used a lot. Um, NGOs in the UN system are, uh, can have something called um, consultative status. The Advocates has special consultative status. And so what that allows us to do is participate in the various human rights mechanisms at the United Nations. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of that UN system, but we're going to focus mostly on the Human Rights Council and the Universal Periodic Review mechanism. Um, so. One more thing before we go to that is just to explain a little bit about why the advocates chooses to use our special consultative status and chooses to use this international advocacy. Um, well, one, one of the reasons is because the, one of the main strategies for the advocates is to work in partnership with um, civil society organizations on the ground. And so the advocates has a close working partnership with the World Coalition Against the, de the Death Penalty. Um, and so many of our partner organizations through the World Coalition Against the Death Penalty 
um, are on the phone today, but um, but a lot of our death penalty international death penalty work is in collaboration with um, with those organizations. Very often, um, human rights defenders who are working on the death penalty and other human rights issues in their home country um, are really um, have small budgets and um, are often under a lot of pressure from from the government and their security issues. So um, we have found that that this kind of UN advocacy and especially working on the um, UPR submissions is a great way to leverage the resources that we have in the United States, um, in, especially in terms of our, our volunteer attorneys. Um, and then, so to leverage those resources and also to build the capacity um, of our partners who are on the ground um, working on the death penalty issues. So we'll talk more about how the interaction is, and but that's the, the why of, of this. The other reason why is that um, the advocates has found that very often these United Nations mechanisms, um, having a strong statement from a, a UN human rights body can be very effective in local advocacy. And so bringing the, um, bringing the sort of connecting the glo global and local, bringing the local human rights issues up to the global community and then bringing um, the, the findings from the global community and statements from the, um, from the global community back down to the local, um, to the local level can be really effective um, in actually moving social change forward in an individual country. Um, so that's the, the reason why we do it. Um, we never do UN advocacy just on its own. It's always part of a broader advocacy strategy um, in collaboration with our partners on the ground. So that's a, a little bit of a peek at, into why, why we do this. Um, let me give you an overview of the international human rights system. And, and don't worry if you know, some of this goes over, your, go, goes over your head, because it is a whole different world in terms of, of, um, of advocacy and very specialized. Um, and yet it is something that you know, shouldn't be too scary, because it is accessible. And it's um, now with, elect with being able to make submissions electronically and um, watching webcasts, it's much more accessible than it was even a few, a few years ago. Um, but basically, the United Nations, as you all know, was established after World War II. Um, through the course of its history, there has been a growing um, emphasis on human rights. And so human rights actually runs through a lot of different elements of the United Nations system. Um, I'm going to talk about a, a few of the, of the, the mechanisms, but, um, but I think the most important thing to understand is that there are a number of human rights functions that are carried out through many different bodies within the United Nations, and those are um, creating treaties, um, at which are which is international law, um, and enforcing and then enforcing the human rights standards that are created by those treaties. Um, monitoring and reporting is another common function. Um, taking complaints is another taking individual complaints um, when the legal system has not provided recourse in the country, um, and in some cases directly improving human rights. So there is one, there's one specialized agency within the United Nations called the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Um, this is a relatively recent creation. It was created in, um, in the 1990s, but has dramatically increased both its budget and its presence around the world. And so some of the work that they do involves um, directly improving human rights in they have, they have offices in, in a number of, of different countries where they're directly working on, on human rights. But they also um, provide a lot of support and capacity um, and for these human rights mechanisms that I'm going to be, that I'll be talking about. Um, so in addition to the Office of the, of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, there are some um, sort of the, the bigger bodies of the United Nations, the General Assembly and the um, Security Council. Both of those have, um, have some human rights functions. Increasingly, the um, human rights is, is a component of the peacekeeping functions of the Security Council. Uh, but the, the major two um, sort of, uh, I guess, uh, kinds of mechanisms are um, the Human Rights Council and the treaty monitoring bodies. And um, I'm going to talk about those in, in depth in, in just a second. Um, 
So the, um, the other thing that we're not going to get into today, but it's important to understand um, because all of these different um, pieces of the system interact, is that uh, there are regional human rights bodies as well that in some, in some ways are sort of parallel to um, um, or you know, look a lot like the United Nations, except they're on the regional level. So here in the United States, we're part of the Inter-American uh, Inter Human Rights System, so the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and the Inter-American Court on Human Rights. Um, within the African system, there's um, the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. Um, the Advocates actually also has observer status, and we use the African Commission as well. Um, the European system is the most robust, um, and so for countries where we're working on death penalty, well, actually, a good example of why it's the most robust, the death penalty has, is, has basically been abolished throughout, um, throughout Europe because of the European um, membership in the European Union requires uh, the abolishment of the, of the death penalty. Um, and then, of course, there's the International Criminal Court, which is a specialized body that is looking for accountability for war crimes and crimes against humanities. Um, so let me talk uh, a little bit about the, the treaty-based mechanisms. Um, international human rights law is created by, um, by multilateral treaties, and so there's a whole series of treaties um, that, ar that ar have arisen since 1949 out of the uh, sort of the original um, non-binding document was the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, which most Americans don't know was primarily drafted by Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, but, with, but after the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, was, which kind of set forth the, um, the standards, the ideas of what economic, social, and cultural rights and what civil and political rights we want to be protected within the international system, um, after that, the next phase was to, to draft um, and promulgate treaties that are uh, binding upon states. And so we do have, in addition to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, we have a whole series of more specialized treaties. And so um, there's the, the, the um, Convention Against Torture, for example. Um, there's the Convention on Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. Um, and so the, the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And for each of those treaties, within the language of the treaty, there is, um, lang or there's language that, that creates a, um, a treaty monitoring body. And these are independent experts who are assigned, many of them are within their own countries, are, um, are academics, are law professors, or sometimes judges. Um, but they're not serving on behalf of their country. They're serving in an independent capacity. Many of them have a lot of expertise in the particular subject area of the treaty. Um, and they, their role is to interpret the treaty um, and then to also make recommendations. Um, so um, let's see. So I don't want to get too far into the weeds on the treaty-based mechanisms because we're going to talk about um, the, the UPR mostly today. But the most important thing to know is that the treaty bodies only the, the treaty bodies are only a, at play if a country has ratified that treaty. Um, so the United States, for example, has not ratified the um, Convention on the Rights of the Child, and so. Um, we have ratified one of the optional protocols, but we don't have to report on our um, implementation of the treaty on a regular basis to the, um, to the Committee on the Rights of the Child. Um, but if a country has ratified the treaty, then the treaty-based mechanisms have a number of enforcement functions. One, and the major one, is the state has to regularly report on how they are complying with the treaties. A number of the treaties also have individual complaint mechanisms. Um, there's some variation among the different human rights treaties about whether you have to sign an additional optional protocol to give, um, to give the, the treaty monitoring body that capacity to take the individual mechanisms. Um, so for example, the United States has signed and ratified the International Co Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, but not the individual complaint mechanism optional protocol. Um, some of the treaty bodies also have some investigative powers and can send a mission to, uh, to go and look into a specific human rights issue. And most of them have the capacity, at least, 
for state versus state complaints. So um, a country could make a complaint about a human rights issue in another country. Um, that has not been used yet. I think it's you know usually seen as being kind of the nuclear option because you know then countries will start uh, going after each other within the, the treaty-based bodies. But it is um, for many of the many of the um, treaty bodies, it is at least a possibility. Um, the last thing I'll say about treaty-based mechanisms is that they do provide some great opportunities for us as an NGO to, to carry out advocacy. Um, and just briefly, a couple of the ways that we, that we do that is if the, when governments are reporting on their compliance with the treaty, they're supposed to engage um, with civil society. And so it creates some opportunities for consultation both before and after the, um, the, the state reports. Um, the major thing is that NGOs write what's called shadow reports, which basically, they're called that, or parallel reports, because they basically follow the government's report to the treaty body on how they're implementing the convention. And as you can imagine, most states, or most governments, um, are paint a fairly rosy picture of how things are going. Um, and will leave things out or, you know, kind of report on the so the positive federal law, but not the lack of implementation or the you know not so positive state law. So um, so these are great opportunities to do the shadow report to say, well, that's true, but you didn't talk about this. Um, and so the advocates does that uses that routinely as part of our as a part of our mechanism. Um, and then again, as I as I said before, you know, international decisions are great opportunities for local media and to, to raise um, raise issues with the with um, with the government. So the so the other major category of um, of human rights mechanisms at the United Nations are the charter based mechanisms. So the unlike the treaty bodies, these apply to every member of the United Nations because they derive their part, their power from the United Nations Charter. Um, and just so you know, this is the Palais des Nations, which is the, um, all of the United Nations human rights work um, is carried out, is based in Geneva. Um, so this was the building that was built for the League of Nations. Um, but it's a, a very stately and very different from the, if you've been to the New York United Nations um, office, it's a quite different feeling um, this is a photo of the Human Rights Council room. The Human Rights Council, and, and actually, so this is from the NGO seats, the ONG being the French acronym for, for NGO. And, um, and so the um, Human Rights Council is the newest human rights mechanism. It was created um, only a few years ago after um, uh, a pretty extensive review of a previous mechanism um, called the, the, the Commission on Human Rights, which, which sort of um, over the years became so highly politicized that the, the feeling was that they needed to start anew with, with a, a new body called the Human Rights Council. Um, the Human Rights Council has a, a number of different functions. There are, it meets regularly throughout the, the year in a number of different sessions. It can hold special sessions and has held special sessions on kind of emerging conflict situations. Um, it can appoint independent experts called through its, that are called special procedures um, that we're not gonna talk about much today, but this is another area where the advocates has, has good success with our UN advocacy working with some of the special procedures. But basically they are um, independent experts or small groups of experts that are assigned the task of looking either at a specific country, and there are about 10 countries that have um, special rapporteurs on the country, or to look at thematic issues. And there's um, about 30, 35 or 40 different thematic issues. So there's a special rapporteur on violence against women, for example, and her job is to you know, analyze violence against women throughout the world. So it's a huge, um, huge job, but, um, but really important. Um, we're gonna talk today about the Universal Periodic Review, which is, again, the, the, the newest mechanism. It's designed to do exactly what the title means. It's universal, applies to every member of the United Nations. It's periodic. Um, it was the, they originally thought it would be every four years. It's a, sort of playing out in practice to be about every four and a half years. Um, 
and we're now in the second round. So every country's already been through the first round, and we're now kind of about midway through the, the second round. Um, and I think it's really important to understand that none of these mechanisms exist in, in a vacuum. Um, they all interplay in with these other aspects of the UN system. So at the, at the Universal Periodic Review, it's somewhat similar to the states having to state reporting process um, with the treaty bodies, except that um, the the NG, the civil society actually report first, um, so it's not a shadow report, but it's also um, the opportunity for other bodies within the system to comment on the human rights record of the. Um, of the country that's being reviewed. So, um, so for example, the um, special procedures, the special rapporteur on violence against women or the special, the working group on arbitrary detention, they have an opportunity to make a submission to the Human Rights Council um, in advance of the review. The, all of the concluding observations from the treaty bodies are included in that review. So it's designed to be much more comprehensive um, and to sort of get the message across a, a second time. It's also designed to be a um, much more of a peer review system. And until I saw this at work, I, I didn't really understand why it would be effective. But there are plenty of countries in the world that um, you know will sort of you know blow off the these independent experts, but listen very carefully to the uh, to the to the peer countries and what they're telling them to do. So there's a lot we don't know about what happens in the negotiations, you know, behind closed doors. Um, but the members of the Human Rights Council are representing their government, and they are members of their foreign, um, their foreign service, so they're diplomats. Um, and the way that the, the Human Rights Council sort of works is that there's a subgroup of them that are called the Working Group on the Universal Periodic Review. Um, there's regional representation. They serve three-year terms. So there's kind of a rotation of who is on the um, on this working group that's that's focusing a little bit more on the universal periodic review process. Um, in practice, the way that the universal period, periodic review process has played out is that you don't have to be on this working group to comment um, or to raise questions for the um, for the country that's going under review. So I think that that's played out a little bit differently than the, the way that they envisioned. Um, but it is designed to be an interactive dialogue, an ongoing interactive dialogue with the, um, with the UN member state that's being reviewed. Um, and there's a new practice that's sort of emerging now where countries are agreeing to come back at the midterm, so at the like two, two and a half year mark and report on how they're, they're implementing the, the recommendations. Um, but as you can imagine, since it is state-driven and um, and, the, and it's a room full of diplomats, um, you know some of the language in the recommendations is not as strong as as we as advocates would would like to see. Um, and countries under review have the opportunity to either accept re or reject the recommendations. Um, so I think I will wrap up there and let Amy talk a little bit more. About um, about how you go about doing the the stakeholder report. Thanks, Jennifer, and again, welcome to everyone. It's great to have you here. So, so we have this diplomatic process that Jennifer described, where you have um, governments making recommendations to other governments, and so in thinking about writing a stakeholder report, I think it's always important to think about who your audience is and tailor your message and tailor your framing to your intended audience. So in the case of the Universal Periodic Review, your audience is not the wonky human rights experts who sit on the treaty bodies who are professors of international human rights law. Your audience is sort of mid-level people in the diplomatic core of countries all around the world. So that's your audience. They, they certainly know about human rights. They, they, you know, a lot of them have you know, been in their post in Geneva for at least a couple of years. Um, and they maybe were involved with human rights in an embassy of their country in, in some part of the world. 
but they're not sort of the the dry um, academic experts. They're they're used to sort of the rough and tumble diplomatic world, and so that's it's good to think about who your audience is. Um, in looking at the N NGO advocacy, the UPR stakeholder reports are really the bread and butter of how NGOs can can participate in the UPR process. So these reports are due well in advance of when this interactive dialogue happens, when, the, when governments make recommendations to other governments. They're due eight to 10 months before that interactive dialogue, and it's only after those NGO reports are submitted that the state has to do its own self-report or self-audit of how it's been complying with its international human rights, with the international human rights standards. And stakeholders are defined broadly. Um, it includes non-governmental organizations, but it can also include national human rights institutions. The United States doesn't have one, but a lot of countries do. It includes individual human rights defenders, um, academic institutions, um, and other civil society representatives. My favorite example of this, if any of you are familiar with uh, South Minneapolis and have heard of the South Side Pride, they submitted a report last September for the Universal Periodic Review of the United States. So little local newspaper got involved and they are a stakeholder in the United Nations process, which I think is awesome. Um, and the stakeholder reports are all submitted to the UN. You upload them online. It's pretty straightforward. And then these poor people who work for the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights have to summarize all of the stakeholder reports submitted for a particular country into a 10-page report. It, there's no wiggle room in the length of that. And we, we've heard word that they are under instructions to reference every stakeholder report at least once. So for a country like the United States that has a lot of you know, drilling down to the South Side pride level up to the ACLU and the Advocates for Human Rights, there are a lot of stakeholder reports to submit and, and then these poor people have to consolidate this all into this 10-page document. You can understand why they need eight to 10 months before the review to get that compilation submitted. For other countries, they don't get quite as many stakeholder reports. It's probably not quite a daunting task. Um, and then the NGOs not only submit stakeholder reports but can engage in lobbying. Um, so they don't only submit that report to the United Nations, but they can reach out directly to countries they want to target to try to persuade them to make recommendations to the country that's, that's up for the review. Um, and you can do that electronically by email. You can do it with in-person meetings in Geneva, which is really exciting, um, to try to highlight certain issues and to try to have a more one-on-one -on -one conversation about what you think the most important issues are and how to frame the recommendations to really say, we'd, we'd really like you to rec make a recommendation that says something like this rather than a different type of recommendation. So that's, I think, quite helpful. Um, Oh, and I should say also that the stakeholders don't have to be in the country that's being reviewed. Uh, if, you, if you took a look at the handouts, you have an example of a stakeholder report we did on the death penalty in Iran. And in Iran, the civil society doesn't have a lot of um, freedom to criticize the government and speak out against the death penalty. So our main partners in doing that report were in the Iranian diaspora. So people who are of Iranian um, origin but live outside of Iran and have a little bit more freedom to speak out against the Iranian government's death penalty practices. Um, so let's move on. Um, if you, I think any um, volunteer attorney or um, attorney who's pursuing a new task likes to, likes to look at examples. And we have provided you with some examples of reports that we have submitted on the death penalty recently for the Universal Periodic Review. But you can also go to the Advocates webpage. And if you go to our international justice section, we have an archive of submissions. And you can peruse to your heart's content all of the reports that we have submitted. And if you want to go beyond the Advocates for Human Rights, we like to think that we set a good standard for reports. But you can also look at all of the reports that have been submitted for universal periodic, periodic reviews of all countries. And I'll show you briefly how to do that. Um, it's fairly easy to find the Universal Periodic Review webpage of the United Nations. Um, and if you look over on the right-hand column, it says Documentation Search by Country. So if you click that link, you get to a drop-down list of all the countries in the world because they all go through the Universal Periodic Review. And if you wanted to look at all the reports submitted for the United States, you can select that. And then what it will take you to is a page, and remember how I said they, they summarize all the stakeholder reports into a 10-page document. You can look at, and I've, I've outlined here in red, the, the summary of the stakeholders' information available in all of the UN languages. 
But that's just the summary. If you want to actually look at the reports, the tricky thing is to click that superscript three. And that takes you to all of the reports themselves, the original documents. And there's, of course, a very long list for the United States, but you see toward the top of the list, of course, is the Advocates for Human Rights. Um, and then you can go and look at all of those, uh, those reports submitted in the original language. And that can be kind of interesting to see what, what has happened, what different groups have said, and uh, what issues they focus on. Because it doesn't tell you from the name of the organization what they what they submit on. And you can see, for example, the Association of Iraqi Jurists submitted a report for the United States Review, and uh, Cuban Association of the United Nations also submitted on human rights conditions in the United States. So everyone is welcome to be a stakeholder in the UPR process. Um, so now we'll do an overview of writing, um, how to write a stakeholder report. We have this 10 steps handout, which is made to sort of boil it down into simple steps, um, setting the stage, sort of doing the, do the background, then gathering the information, and then implementing, doing the report and doing the follow-up on the report. We'll also cover some tips for working with in-country partners. As Jennifer mentioned, we're a member of the World Coalition Against the Death Penalty, so a lot of our death penalty advocacy is working with partner organizations in other countries that retain the death penalty and collaborating with them on doing a report. So we'll talk about some of those tips and best practices. And actually, we'll hold the questions until the very end after Rose goes into more depth on the death penalty uh, rather than taking questions in the middle of the presentation. So step zero, because you can't have 11 steps. So step zero is just knowing what the rules are. And going back to that Universal Periodic Review page that I, that I showed you before, you'll see in the bottom right is a link for NGOs and NHRIs, NGOs, non-governmental organizations. And if you click that link, it will take you to the rules. So there are technical guidelines for stakeholder submissions. Um, and it has an online system for uplo uploading the reports, and then it also gives the tentative deadlines. And the tentative deadlines are switched to final deadlines once they're finalized, of course. So that's sort of where the rules are on the UN website. And the rules sometimes change. They change from page limits to word limits. I think they got savvy, like a lot of judges have and courts have. Um, but that's, that's where you find the rules. And the basic rules are that if it's an individual report from just one NGO, you get 2,815 words. So that's not very long. It's about five pages. Um, and if it's a coalition, more than one NGO, you get twice that amount. The word limits don't include footnotes or endnotes, but they also expressly say, we won't read your footnotes or endnotes. So don't try to cram a lot of substance into them. The, the UN won't look at them. You number your paragraphs and pages, submit it as a Word document only, use the online submission system, and our next deadline coming up, there are three deadlines during the year, is March 23rd, so that's coming up pretty soon, and those are the countries that are in that, that particular round of review coming up. Some of them retain the death penalty, like um, St. Lucia and St. Kitts and Nevis in the Caribbean, um, and Mauritania, for example, coming up. I think we have some Mauritanians on the line and on the computer, so, um, on the internet. So um, there are a lot of retentionist countries that are coming up in this next round of review. Um, other things to know in terms of what the UN says it wants to see in a stakeholder report, they prefer joint submissions. They prefer a lot of different organizations to collaborate on reports, which makes sense. Um, and they prefer firsthand information. So information that people have seen and gathered themselves rather than secondhand information and secondary sources. So there's really a preference for primary sources rather than secondary sources. And what are you supposed to write about? Well, now that we're in the second cycle, they want you to focus your writing on implementing any accepted recommendations from the first time around. So you need to go back and look at what recommendations were accepted the first time around and what, if anything, has the government done to implement those recommendations and any developments since the last review. So for the past four and a half years, they don't want you to go back and do a 20 year history of the death penalty in a country. They just want to know what's new since we last visited this issue at the UPR. Uh, their uh, stakeholders are encouraged to submit reports that have credible and reliable information. Um, so that's really important and, you know, sometimes you, you struggle for information because it may be hard to get information on the ground in a particular country about the death penalty and, and you have to be really, 
um, thoughtful about what your sources of information are and whether they are credible. And your partner organization can be of great help in that regard. Um, and then you're supposed to also identify possible recommendations. Because remember, the end game is getting governments to make recommendations to the government that's being reviewed. So you, in your report, should say, these are recommendations that we want governments to make to the government that's being reviewed. Um, and another rule is don't include manifestly abusive language, which I don't think any attorney, well, I don't think many attorneys would, would do, but you can see there are some very, some reports use very incendiary language and that's just not generally accepted at the United Nations and particularly in this highly diplomatic process of the UPR. Um, so step one, getting to the steps, is to know what your expertise is. Um, so your expertise as a volunteer attorney or the advocates for human rights expertise, or in this case, especially if you're working with a partner organization through the World Coalition, what's their area of expertise? They, they obviously are concerned about the death penalty. Do they have any particular area of focus? Do they go to death row and visit prisoners and monitor what the conditions are like there? Do they pay attention to news reports on in capital cases about whether there's due process, whether there's a right to appeal? Do they have specific knowledge of the law that applies to the death penalty, what, what sort of information do they have and what issues do they focus on? Because as Rose will tell you, there are a lot of different death penalty issues. So it's good to know what your expertise is, what your issues are, and what your advocacy goals are. And this is a really important stage to be collaborating with your partner organization on the ground. What is it that they want to accomplish? I would guess that any member of the World Coalition would say we want to abolish the death penalty in our country. But are there any intermediate steps? Are there any intermediate goals that like, they'd like to see accomplished through the UPR? And then look at what are the resources? Who can help with this report that you're going to pull together? Are there secondary sources that are credible that you can draw on? Are there other individuals you can get involved? And enlist those people as soon as you can, because it's, it's a busy um, process. The next step is to identify your allies. And ally, you may have allied organizations or experts. And again, if you have a partner on the ground, they may know, oh, yeah, we really want to bring in this particular professor, this other NGO. And if you see some of our sample UPR stakeholder reports, some of them have a lot of logos at the top. And that shows that our partner on the ground pulled together a lot of different groups to share information and contribute to the report and sign on. And that really enhances credibility if you can have more groups collaborating on a report. Um, then you may find other allies to help um, with tactical tips or to provide other support. There are some groups that are really good at just looking at the text of recommendations and saying, let's tweak the recommendation in this particular way. It might have a better chance of getting accepted. And there's the power in numbers. So having um, the Advocates for Human Rights will submit reports, we'll have the main authors with their logos on the top, and then we'll also have sign-on. So we'll have an appendix that lists you know, maybe 100 different individuals and organizations that have signed on to say, we believe we support this report and that can have a lot of moral force when you're doing your lobbying and advocacy. Step three is identifying the rights. And again, thinking about your audience here, we're not targeting the wonky academic experts in human rights. We're targeting diplomats. So you don't have to get too technical in terms of thinking about what the rights are. But sometimes there's specific treaty language that can be relevant. Um, for instance, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights doesn't, o doesn't outright prohibit the death penalty, but it does say that it should be applied in only the most serious crimes. And Rose will talk about that. So if a country, uh, imposes a death penalty in cases of a possession of drugs, that's clearly not the most serious crime. And so that would uh, implicate some of the, that treaty language. The Convention on the Rights of the Child talks about not executing um, people who, for crimes they committed when they were children. Um, so that's, again, you can draw on some of the treaty language there. Um, you may also look at um, some of the treaty bodies issue general comments on certain topics. So they'll issue sort of what they think the treaty language means, and sometimes those general comments can be helpful. And then you can also look at what treaty bodies have said about um, the state that's being reviewed in the UPR, what they've said about their compliance um, in with, with a particular treaty, and sometimes that's relevant. So, so for example, the United States went through its review last year under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and that treaty body talked about the death penalty in the United States. And you can look at that in pulling together a report for the Universal Periodic Review of the United States, because it's sort of the freshest 
expert information about what the state, state is of the death penalty in the United States. Um, the next thing to do is review the procedural history. So remember we said one of the things they want you to include in the report is what progress has been made in implementing any recommendations that were accepted in the last cycle. So you want to find out what happened during the last universal periodic review. So read what's called the report of the working group and that will tell you what recommendations were made. And it, the report of the working group may also say which ones were accepted and which ones were rejected, or it may that the accepted, rejected may appear in an, an addendum. And in the addendum, sometimes the country under review will say yes or no to the recommendations, but also will give some sort of explanation. And that can be really helpful to sort of shed light on what position the government is taking on a particular issue. The next step in um, reviewing the procedural history is looking at what happened with other human rights mechanisms. So it's possible that one of the special procedures Jennifer talked about, one of the special rapporteurs visited the country and issued a report after that visit. The concluding observations from the treaty bodies may also shed some light um, on things. And then there may be some results from the regional mechanisms, such as the African Commission or the Inter-American Inter Commission. The Inter-American Commission has hearings frequently on death penalty cases here in the United States. So they, um, if, if a person on death row has exhausted all of their remedies in the US judicial system, they may turn to the Inter-American Commission. And they will have hearings and sometimes issue some findings with respect to that. And that's also information you may want to include in your stakeholder report. Um, to review the procedural history from the Universal Periodic Review, you go back to this page which we've seen before when we talked about how to find the, the stakeholder reports, and that's where also the page where you can find the report of the working group and any addendum. So this is for the United States where you can find that from the first cycle of the review, which you can see happened in 2010. Um, the next step in the procedure is to clarify what your role and what your partner organization's role is. And typically, your role in writing the stakeholder report is not to rehash how horrible the death penalty is or how it's a violation of human rights. The dipl diplomats that are going to be on board with making death penalty recommendations, their countries are opposed to the death penalty. And so they're going to be willing to speak out. Where you and your partner organization can add value is to show what's happening on the ground, what's actually happening in the country relating to the death penalty. So that on the ground information, firsthand accounts, sometimes they, there are already published reports in that country and so taking distilling the information from those reports and putting it in a user-friendly short report for your diplomat audience can be really helpful um, maybe there is they have specialized knowledge about you know here's what the law says and here's how it's implemented in the in the judicial system here's how um, there's no there's no right to appeal or if a defendant is found not guilty the prosecution has the right to appeal that and a court of appeals can actually find somebody guilty rather than it happening at the trial level that happens in some countries. So that sort of specialized knowledge or other information, it's really a matter of collaborating with your partner organization with any other credible secondary sources you can find to figure out how you can shed more light about the facts on the ground. The next step is setting goals. And if you think about what the end game is, it's that interactive dialogue where different governments are posing questions and making recommendations to the government that's under review. So think about what, what you would like governments to ask, of what, what kind of questions you'd like them to ask, and most importantly, what recommendations you want them to make to the government under review. And recommendations are critical because the only thing the government under review has to do is say yes or no to the recommendations. They don't have to answer any questions. You know, people can, can pose all sorts of questions. They don't have to answer them, but they do have to go through every recommendation that's made during the three-hour interactive dialogue, and they have to say thumbs up or thumbs down. No, they don't, have to, they don't have to say yes to any of them, but they at least have to respond. So if you think about what your goals are, what recommendations do you want to have made, and do you want to have those recommendations accepted? So, so there's sort of two prongs there. Do you, want, you maybe want a really strong, really great recommendation that would be sort of pie in the sky, but if that's not going to be accepted, then maybe you want to refine with your partner organization what recommendations might actually be accepted. So thinking about your goals in that regard, and it might be a balance. So maybe your partner organization says, yes, we definitely want to push governments to recommend abolition of the death penalty, but we also want to recommend that they do these other things that would also, in the interim, be really helpful. <laughs> 
and we'll talk a little bit, we'll talk more um, about recommendations, do a little workshopping of that with, after Rose talks. Step seven is, is implementing your work plan. So it's connecting steps five, which is the clarifying your role and what, what information you have to share and what your end goals are, what recommendations you wanna see coming out of the UPR, and then gathering that information, pulling together your sources, paying attention to credibility, looking at making sure your information is recent since the last review, and then keep in mind how your partner organizations may want to use that report not only with the UN review, with the UPR, but they may want to use it in other advocacy contexts as well. So that's worth having a conversation with them about. Then write the report. And I think most attorneys are familiar with how to do this. You set up a writing team, and maybe the team is a team of one, but maybe you have other people involved. And take that information you've pulled together and incorporate in your report proposed questions that you'd like to see posed to the government under review and recommendations. And of course, avoid the abusive language. Then you want to finalize and submit your report. Be careful of those deadlines because they are not negotiable and use that online submission system or the advocates will use it and upload it. Um, and of course, the option is to recruit sign-ons as well. But you wanna make sure that any organization whose name is on the front of a report, who has their logos on the front of the report, that they've had a chance to review it as well because we, we, we wanna make sure that, that they are on board with it. So you wanna build in that time for them to give a final okay and review for that report. So that's step nine. Step 10 is doing the advocacy, and the advocacy as part of the UPR, UPR can be going, uh, reaching out to the diplomats by email or in person, um, and also not only advocacy with, uh, to try to get the recommendations to be made, but then once the recommendations are made, doing advocacy with the government that's under review to try to get them to accept the recommendations, try to get them to give the thumbs up. And sometimes that thumbs up, thumbs down comes right away, like when, uh, within a, a few days of the interactive dialogue, but sometimes it comes nine months later. So there may be an extended time to do some advocacy to try to press the government to accept those recommendations. And then, of course, if an, a recommendation is accepted, then that's a huge advocacy tool for organizations on the ground and internationally because the government committed to this. They made a promise. And so now the government has four years to get that promise done to see that it can happen. And so that's another huge part of advocacy coming out of the Universal Periodic Review. And then it can also be a tool for longer term social justice. So using the report as a tool for education and outreach, um, using it with the media and using it with um, lawmakers in the country as well. Um, tips for working with partner organizations. So we'll run through these um, now. Um, one, at, at, at the early stages, give the partner a list of potential issues and have them prioritize and select. As Jennifer said, the partner organizations can be really busy and stretched for resources, so try to make it easier for them. Try to give them a, a, a list of things to choose from, um, you can also send them, okay, we know we've found these secondary sources, do you have additional secondary sources you can give us? Um, Another thing you can uh, is, would be at step five, list the resources you've gathered, see if they can supplement your list of resources. Um, identify information gaps. So if your partner says, your partner organization says conditions on death row are horrible, then you can say, is there a way that you can help assist us with gathering information to document that? Maybe it's a simple questionnaire or survey for people who go to visit death row. They can just record how many people are in a cell of what size. They can talk to the people on death row about how frequently they receive meals or access to health care. There may be really simple ways to gather that on the ground information in collaboration with your partner organization. And that can be, it sounds really simplistic, but it's hugely valuable information because it shows what's actually happening on the ground. And and you, with the, with the help of your partner organization, can help get that information to the United Nations. And then with step six, where you're looking at recommendations, again, communicate with your partner organization to identify the goals and, and making sure you have specific and measurable recommendations that you can use in your advocacy and in your report. Um, other tips for working with partner organizations. For, with the work plan, give your partner organization specific deadlines, a time frame for, okay, we'll be sending you a draft by this date. Will you be able to give us responses by this date? So keeping those lines of communication open and managing expectations in terms of when things are gonna happen and when you'll need a response. Um, circulating a draft to the partner to see if the partner can help identify any gaps or clarify anything that might be um, inaccurate or incomplete. And then step nine, does the partner want to be listed as a co-author? Oftentimes they do, they want credit, they want, uh, they want to um, uh, 
take claim to the work that they, they've helped with. But in some cases, they may not want to be listed as a co-author, or they may want to be listed, but they may not want certain other organizations to be listed as a co-author because it may affect their advocacy or it may affect their credibility. So those are important conversations to have with your partner organization about who should be named as author or co-author of the report. Um, more tips for working with partner organizations. I thought at this point, uh, before, before we, um, jump into best practices, I thought I would turn over to my, my colleagues to see if they have any other tips that they would add since they, we, all three of us have had a lot of opportunities to work with partner organizations on re reports. So Jennifer and Rose, do you have any additional tips that you might share right now about working with partner organizations or any anecdotes to, to add? Well, I think the one thing that I would add is that very often you're working with partners who don't speak English or, you know, English is not their native language. Um, for a lot of the countries where we're working, um, Google Translate actually works pretty well for, you know, the sort of, you know, quick and dirty communication um, on collaboration. Um, but you might have to plan for building in more time in order to get a, you know, a real translation of the draft done. Mm -hmm. And also check with us because we may have volunteers who are willing to help with translation. Um, so we can certainly put some feelers out there and see if we've got anyone on board. And there, there have been situations to, to add, add on to the language issues. There have been situations where we've had a partner who speaks or is able to email in English but not with a great deal of clarity. And in that case, we've encouraged that person to, to write to us in their first language and we will find somebody to translate those emails and they can send us documents in their um, whatever language they have at hand and we will sort of gather together our forces and our volunteers to help that communication happen. So that's another way to think about ways to approach the language barrier. Any other tips that you would think of based on your experiences, Rose or Jennifer? I think the only other thing I would add is um, we certainly want to provide the entire report for our partner to review in its entirety. But if I have some really pressing issues that I have huge question marks over, for example, if I'm actually describing an article of the criminal code correctly, that's really important to be able to do so. I will flag that. I will add a comment. I will highlight it. Um, so I think picking out pieces for your partners, too, in case they do have limited time for your most urgent questions is a good tip, too. I think I would just also make a comment about, um, about sort of communication and the reality of life on the ground in a lot of countries. Um, and, you know, I, th I think it's important to give people a lot of leave time or, you know, send things far ahead of time, build that into your system because many of our partners are in countries where there's not regular internet access, there might be um, you know, interruptions in, in just day-to-day -day business practice because of strikes or you know, I know in, in West Africa now a lot of our partners that are working in Liberia and Sierra Leone have had big business interruptions because of the Ebola crisis. So um, yeah, just building that into your timeline, and and don't give up if you don't hear back right away. It's you know completely appropriate to continue to to you know send emails or to Skype. Thanks. Um, so just a few best practices um, in terms of framing the issue. It's always helpful for the governments, especially the governments you're targeting for your advocacy, to know here's what the government's position is. Here's what the government has said before about this death penalty issue, either what they said in the U Universal Periodic Review from the last cycle or what they said to a treaty body. And then here's what's really going on. Here's the, the actual facts and circumstances on the ground, providing those facts from your partner organization or through credible reports that you've been able to identify. Um, use examples to highlight problems. I examples and case studies are really helpful. Um, and use them to highlight gaps in the law where there, there's a gap between law and practice or barriers to implementation. There might be a really good law in place that isn't being implemented. I think in Malawi, there was a case where they, they changed the law in a really positive way with, with respect to the death penalty, but then it was not implemented. Like it, it, Nobody did anything about it. So the government of Malawi may very well be boasting about this great law that they passed, but it's not seeing any results on the ground or very minimal results. And so that's really valuable information to share and to highlight in a stakeholder report. Um, footnote all of your sources and keep track of them. 
Um, avoid um, copying and pasting from other reports that, that other NGOs did. That's considered to be bad form. If you're going to cite the other reports, use footnotes, and if you're copying, then put quotation marks around it. Um, you don't need to have a lengthy procedural history. You don't have the space in a UPR report to give that, but it's also just not necessary for your audience. It's necessary for you to understand that procedural history, but you don't have to commit it to the final draft of what you're submitting. Um, you don't need a lengthy discussion of the substance of the particular rights. The, you don't need to argue in a death penalty submission for the Universal Periodic Review. You don't need to, and you shouldn't argue that the death penalty is a horrible violation of human rights. It is, and your target audience already accepts that. So you can be very brief in making those statements and then jump into where you're going to add value, which is the facts on the ground. Um, you don't need lengthy legal analysis. You don't need to go into what different treaty bodies said in detail about particular human rights violations. It shouldn't have the tone of a legal brief. You're not trying to advocate for a judge to issue a particular outcome. It's more a, a, a policy piece, it's an advocacy piece that you're going to use to target diplomats. Um, and try to avoid vague recommendations. In the end, some recommendations do turn out to be vague, but leave that to the diplomats to vagify your recommendations. Try to keep your recommendations really crisp, and we'll talk more about that later after Rose talks. So I will then pass things off to Rose to jump into all of the death penalty issues that you can issue spot when you're working with your partner organizations. All right, so I'm going to cover a number of issues on the death penalty. And as you research and write your UPR stakeholder report, keep in mind you do not need to cover every single issue I'm going to be talking about today. Many of the issues may not be relevant in your country's context. And in fact, because of that strict word limit, I like to tell people to aim for three to five issues. That number is flexible, of course, because it's going to depend on the situation in your country. So what you see here is a snapshot of the international law. And both Amy and Jennifer mentioned this in the beginnings of their presentations. But I'm bringing this up because this will give you an idea of the basic standards to which you can hold a government accountable. For example, if you're wondering if juveniles are protected against the death penalty, or if every person has the right to an appeal under international law, these are the standards to which you can turn. I have not included all of the international human rights treaties, but this is a good basic start. And you can always contact one of us if you have a question about the standards. Now, as you begin writing your stakeholder report, the first step you want to take is issue spotting to find out what are the major death penalty issues in that country. I personally like to break it down into the major stages of first looking at the law itself, then looking at death sentences, and finally executions. And using these as your benchmarks, you should be on the lookout for any issues that arise at or between any of these stages. And here's where you see a non-exhaustive list of all the possible issues throughout that process. With regard to analyzing the law itself, I want to stress how important and as well as how challenging it is to make sure you have the right law. Criminal codes do get amended, and it's absolutely critical that we have the most recent version when we are describing its provisions in our stakeholder report, because it can harm our credibility if our report is citing to a certain article, but since then it's been uh, repealed or it's been changed. So one thing that I do as I'm doing my research is I keep an eye out for secondary sources, like reports or news articles that happen to mention that the criminal code was recently amended, because then I know that law has changed as of that date, and I need to make sure I've got the most recent law. So let's start by talking about the issues now. One of the first things you should be watching for is what crimes are punishable by death in your country. International standards say that if the death penalty is going to be imposed, it should be reserved for only the most serious crimes. That is your standard. These are crimes where there was intent to kill and lethal or extremely grave consequences. So that means crimes that don't result in the victim's death are not considered the most serious crimes. So if you find that a country permits and imposes the death penalty for violent crimes that do not result in someone's death, that's something you want to bring into your report. 
You may also find that a country takes it a step further and they impose the death penalty for nonviolent crimes like drug offenses or economic crimes. This is also an important issue to bring into your report. And I'll give an example about drug offenses in Malaysia later on. Also, keep your eyes open for very expansive definitions of activities that are considered acts of terrorism. We're seeing a lot of widening of the law in terms of what kind of activities constitute terrorism. In Vietnam, which is a retentionist country with a death penalty, the definition of national security crimes is very broad. Vietnam's criminal code makes no distinction between violent acts like terrorism and the peaceful exercise of the right to freedom of expression. So this is the kind of fact that you would bring into a UPR submission because the scope of the death penalty overreaches the most serious crimes and it could potentially include peaceful protesters. Another thing to watch out for in the laws is whether the country has a mandatory death penalty. When there is a mandatory death penalty for specific crimes, there's no sentencing phase. If the defendant is found guilty, he or she is automatically sentenced to death. So in these cases, the courts have no discretion to consider the facts of the offense, the characteristics of the individu individual offender, or any other mitigating circumstances that could reduce that sentence to life. Mandatory death penalties can be for all different kinds of offenses. Countries don't always restrict mandatory death sentences to the worst of the worst. So in the Caribbean, there are only two countries that carry a mandatory death penalty, Trinidad and Tobago and Barbados, and this is for the crime of murder. But in Malaysia, there is a mandatory death penalty for drug trafficking. A court is not permitted to consider a defendant's lack of a criminal record or the desperate circumstances that may have led that person to choose to traffic drugs before imposing that sentence. So let's take a closer look at Malaysia. We did a submission on Malaysia a couple of years ago to the UN. Malaysia's criminal code through the Dangerous Drug Act of 1952, we'll just call it the Drug Act, imposes a mandatory death penalty when someone is found guilty of drug trafficking. Now the definition of trafficking depends on the amount of drugs found in that accused person's possession. And the amount of drugs is what will trigger the trafficking label in turn, and that varies by the types of drugs. So under Section 37D, which you see here, if a given drug is found in a prohibitively large amount, that possession shall be presumed, until the contrary is proved, to be trafficking of that said drug. In other words, simply finding prohibited drugs on someone's person raises a presumption that they knowingly possessed it. So this basically contravenes the basic human rights principle that anyone charged with a criminal offense must be presumed Ill innocent until and unless proved guilty under the law. Let me give you the example of Raisa Shah, who was arrested in 2000 for carrying a bag of cannabis. The bag contained 800 grams of cannabis, which is over the 200 grams required to define the offense as trafficking punishable by death. The trial court found that Raisa possessed the drugs in the alleged quantities, and the law left the court with no discretion but to convict him of drug trafficking and hand down the mandatory death sentence. The appeals court then overturned his conviction, finding that the prosecution had not proved that Raisa had knowledge of the bag's contents. But then the highest court in Malaysia agreed with the prosecutor's appeal, concluding that Raisa Shah had failed to, pro to prove that he was not guilty of drug trafficking, and then they reinstated the death sentence in 2009. So now he's been appealing to the president for commutation. But we're talking about 800 grams of cannabis. So we brought Raisa Shah's case example up in our submission to the UN. And so this is a good example of how you can use a real life example of a single individual to illustrate your point. Another issue to examine in each country is who can be executed. International and regional standards protect certain groups from the death penalty, like pregnant women, juvenile offenders, and even the elderly. When we wrote our Iran report, we highlighted the fact that Iran allows for the execution of juvenile offenders, and Iran is also executing them. The country will often hold them until they turn 18 and then kill them, but nevertheless, they are still executing juvenile offenders. 
Iran's penal code explicitly defines the age of criminal responsibility for children as the age of maturity that's defined under Sharia law, meaning that girls over nine years of age and boys over 15 years of age are eligible for execution if they're convicted of certain crimes. So for example, a 10-year-old girl in Iran could be executed for committing apostasy or changing her religion. Keep in mind, as you're doing your UPR stakeholder report, there are very few countries in the world today that still execute juveniles, uh, juvenile offenders, I should say. And the most recent ones who have carried out such executions are Iran, Saudi Arabia, and Yemen. This is also a good example where you need to pay attention to both sentences and executions, because a country may sentence juveniles to death but never execute them, and they may also sentence and execute juvenile offenders. Either case has good information to include because even in the former case, a country has still sentenced a juvenile to death even if that death sentence is never implemented. That person is still sitting on death row as a juvenile offender. Now foreigners also face some unique challenges. They may face discrimination in the criminal justice, justice system of that country where they are. There may be a lack of due process due to various kinds of barriers. They may face financial resource challenges, and this is particularly true for migrant workers. And there may be also issues of access to consular assistance. So I want to describe a couple of these issues more in detail. A lot of foreign nationals are on death rows in countries like Indonesia, Singapore, and Malaysia for drug trafficking offenses. In Indonesia, about 80% of drug offenders on their death row are foreign. And for example, in 2008, two Nigerians were imprisoned for drug trafficking, and then they were executed by a firing squad with only one day's notice of their deaths. So if you're doing a report on a country with very harsh drug trafficking laws, it's a good idea to also take a step further and just examine what the situation is for foreign nationals there. Second of all, foreign migrant workers are also vulnerable to death sentences. For example, in Saudi Arabia, there are many foreign migrant workers on death row, in some cases accused of the murder of or even witchcraft against their employers. And lastly, the access to consular assistance is something that has come up in the United States and may arise with any country that has signed the Vienna Convention on Consular Rights, or the VCCR. Even though the U.S. is a party to this treaty, we denied 54 Mexican nationals their right to consular assistance, which would have also gotten them better legal representation in their capital trials. Instead, they were all sentenced to death. So issues like these are also relevant to bring before the Human Rights Council to show discrimination. And that leads us into our next slide, discrimination and arbitrariness. Some countries practice discrimination in their application of the death penalty. This may be the de jure discrimination found in the language of the law itself, or it could be discrimination that simply happens in practice. For example, let's talk about the law. There have been attempts to introduce the death penalty into law for homosexuality in Uganda and in Liberia. Now, even though they have not passed into law, fortunately, some attempts are still valid valid information to bring before the Human Rights Council and tell them what lawmakers are trying to do in that country. In terms of discrimination and practice, the U.S. is sadly a very good example of this. Here we have de facto blatant racial discrimination in our capital punishment system. If the victim is white, a defendant is far more likely to receive a death sentence. And you will also find a greater proportion of racial minorities on death row relative to the population at large. And along with discrimination, of course, comes arbitrariness. Arbitrariness because of where the crime was committed, the political climate, the backgrounds of the defendant and the victim, and so on. So any factors that you might find that contribute to the arbitrariness of the death penalty are also relevant to include. Allegations of torture are also relevant to bring up in a stakeholder report, as torture often comes into play during interrogations or on death row. Let's use the example of Iwa Hak Hakamada. He's a Japanese man who was sentenced to death. He spent 45 years on death row before he was exonerated and released. And his confession took place after interrogation and torture for 20 days without access to a judge or a lawyer. And without that confession, there really wasn't any other dependable evidence for his conviction. 
This man is now 78 years old. He is thought to have been the world's longest serving death row inmate who was innocent. And even though this case happened in 1968, it was still relevant to bring into a UPR submission because he was still on death row. So in that case, I would say even though we've kind of got this rule of going back to the last UPR submission, this is still relevant because the human rights violations are still occurring. Now and today, he's exonerated and he's free. So there may still be reason to bring in this topic, but with regard to his right for a remedy. After all those years he spent wrongfully convicted on death row, he does have a right to reparations for the human rights violations. So that's a new issue you could still bring up. And I'll talk more about that later. The right to a lawyer and to competent legal representation is another major issue. And I'll use the example of Malawi to illustrate this. And we do have copies of our Malawi submission back there. When we did our submission in Malawi, we highlighted the fact that in that entire country, there are only 11 legal aid lawyers for the entire country of Malawi. Many of Malawi's public defenders are very new lawyers. They are often hired directly from law school, and so they're underqualified to work on these complicated death penalty cases. There's a lack of resources to conduct proper pretrial investigations. And the background investigations are oftentimes not even conducted because the defendants may live in remote villages that are not accessible because there aren't the resources to get there. And most often, the only witness for the defense is the accused person himself or herself. The right to an appeal and to seek pardon or commutation is fairly self-explanatory. And I'll just build on the example of Malawi and say that in our UPR submission, we also pointed out that only half of the 200 prisoners sentenced to death were able to vindicate their right to an appeal on their death sentences because they didn't have legal representation. Now, there are all kinds of death row conditions that you can bring up in a UPR submission. And keep in mind, as you're researching your country, you may not be able to find specific facts about death row in your country. But in some countries, they actually mix their death row populations with their prison populations, the general prison population. So if you can verify this, you can probably bring in facts relating to the prisons if that's where the death row prisoners are living. So I'm going to use this slide to say that using real life case examples, kind of like the case of Reza Shah in Malaysia, to illustrate your facts is perfectly fine to do so. In our Jamaica report, we describe the abysmal death row conditions, and we use the specific case of a man named Mr. Francis, who was held in a 10 by 10 foot cell that was dirty and infested with cockroaches and rats for 12 years. He was allowed out of his cell for just a few minutes each day, and on some days he was not even allowed out at all. He was regularly beaten by the guards, but then he was denied medical treatment for those injuries, which included a severe head wound. And as to the psychological conditions, Mr. Francis was held in the death cell, which is basically the penultimate scene in a death row inmate's life before he's executed. And this death cell was located next to the gallows, and he was held there for five days. During this time, he was under surveillance for 24 hours per day, and he could hear the gallows being tested. The guards then weighed Mr. Francis to determine the necessary drop on the hanging rope, and then the executioner taunted Mr. Francis about his impending hanging and the length of time it was going to take for him to die. So this is a very powerful example to bring into a stakeholder report and drive your main point home. Another issue I want to bring up about death row conditions is that inmates on death row are sometimes denied basic access to education, job skills training, GED uh, training and certificates and rehabilitation. And that's because they're not expected to get out. And so even when families of death row prisoners have offered to pay for these kinds of classes and skills training, they've still been denied. So these are important things that you can bring up in any UPR submission. Let's turn now to methods of execution. Another issue that can be brought up in your stakeholder report is the kind of execution that the country uses. Hanging is the most common form of execution in the world, and about 60 countries authorize this practice. Because hanging is so common, I would probably only bring it into a UPR submission if there's been a botched execution or other kinds of circumstances. For example, in Iran, a man was hanged, but then 48 hours later, it was discovered that he was still alive at the morgue. 
and the only reason that was discovered was because the morgue worker could see vapor on the plastic bag covering his face. They actually discussed whether they should rehang this man, but they finally decided it wasn't uh, a good idea to subject him to death a second time. So I would bring in something like that because it was so heinously botched and shows the cruel and inhumanity um, of this kind of punishment. Another issue I might bring up in the case of hanging is if they do the hanging publicly, like in Iran, and they let the body hang from the crane in public for some time. Public executions themselves have actually been deplored by the UN as inhuman and degrading treatment. While most hangings in Iran are carried out within prisons, there are still public executions taking place. In 2012, there were at least 60 reported cases of public hanging, and in 2013, that number rose to 63. So think about the kind of trauma this public image inflicts on any witnesses, including children who pass by. And these public executions really do imprint on the public. In Iran in 2013, there was at least one documented case of an eight-year-old boy who died because he was playing and staging a mock execution. I would also bring up a method of execution if those methods are especially cruel and inhuman in how they are carried out like the botched executions um, using lethal injection in the United States. And we have seen a lot in the news lately. And our UPR submission on the United States in the back of the room goes into some more detail about this. Now, in this diagram, what you see here is Iran's method of execution by stoning. Nine countries in the world still authorize this practice. The Iran Penal Code allows for stoning for adultery if the adulterer is married, but if they are unmarried, that person can also be lashed instead. So what I would bring into a UPR submission is the fact that the Iran Penal Code allows for stoning and for a nonviolent crime. And then I would bring in any case examples that have happened over the past four years to illustrate this. Now, the details that you see portrayed about this picture have actually been since removed from the penal code because the penal code used to be very specific about the manner of execution and the types of stones that should be used. Article 102 would state that a man had to be buried up to his waist and women up to their breasts for the purpose of execution by stoning. And the law would state, used to state that the stones should not be too big enough to kill the person with only one or two strikes, nor should they be so small that they could not be defined as stones. So not too large, not too small, clearly designed to inflict the greatest possible suffering. Notification is also an important piece, and it relates to both the sentenced person and to their family. Check how the country notifies the sentenced individuals who are sitting on death row. For example, in Japan, death row inmates are not informed of the date or the time of their execution until one hour before it actually takes place. This lack of a prior announcement completely deprives inmates of opportunities to challenge the legitimacy of their executions, and it leaves them in a continual state of uncertainty as to when they are going to die. And also check what kind of information does the country provide the families of those who are sentenced to death. In Taiwan, we heard from our partner organization that families find out their relatives have been executed from the news reports on TV that evening. And in Belarus, I want to bring up a specific case. And this was the mother of a condemned prisoner who was not informed of details about her son's execution. So she was constantly living in a state of continual uncertainty. There was total secrecy about his date of execution, his place of burial, and the state refused to relinquish the body to her as his mother. This is inhuman treatment of the family members and it intimidates and punishes them by continually leaving them in this state of distress. And I bring up this case because the UN specifically found this case to constitute cruel and inhuman punishment and was a violation of human rights. Wrongful convictions may also be an issue in your country. Now, I want to touch on three different points under the wrongful convictions point. First, you have people who have been sentenced and released. People who have spent time on death row and sometimes prison when their sentences have been commuted to a life imprisonment sentence. What's really powerful to bring into a UPR stakeholder report is the number of years in prison. The Japanese example that I gave you, that man spent 45 years on death row for a crime he never committed. It's also powerful to highlight the ages they were in when they went in and came out, especially if they were very young. Glenn Ford was a man who was recently exonerated in the United States, 
He was about 34 years old when he was wrongfully convicted and sent to death row. He was 64 when he was exonerated and released. Now, with wrongful convictions, I don't really spend a lot of time in my reports on the causes for wrongful conviction, except where it would show serious, egregious problems in the system that violate human rights, like massive prosecutorial misconduct that's rampant in that country or incompetent legal representation. The second bullet point are those people who are sentenced and still in prison. You may find information in your country about innocent people that are still sitting on death row. There was a recent study published in the United States that found probably 4.1% of people on death row in the United States are probably innocent. So if you have very strong evidence of an innocent person on death row, you can bring them in as a case example. And then there's a third point I want to bring up, and those are the people who are sentenced and executed who are probably innocent. In the United States, there have been at least 10 individuals who were likely innocent but executed. And I'm also going to bring up the United States to illustrate this as an example, because the US is very sadly a good example of the problem of innocence and the death penalty. Here in this country, 150 people have been sentenced to death and exonerated because they were innocent. The average number of years between their death sentence and their exoneration is 11.2 years. This is very powerful information to bring into a UPR report. And at this stage, I would also bring in any case examples of specific individuals if they are recent, compelling, and would support my main points. Here's a picture of Glenn Ford. You can see he was the man who I mentioned was around 34 when he went in and 64 when he was exonerated. Another issue to be aware of is whether the state offers adequate remedies when someone's human rights have been violated throughout the proceedings. When someone's human rights have been violated, perhaps they've been tortured, maybe they've been denied due process of law, they have a right to a remedy. There are five basic forms of reparations, restitution, satisfaction, guarantees of non-repetition, uh, non compensation, and rehabilitation. Remedies should be context appropriate. For example, with regard to the use of torture in Iraq, where half of the examined death penalty cases involved torture to get a confession, that was still allowed as evidence in their trials. So in our report, we pointed out that there was no credible process for reviewing those allegations of torture or providing relief or compensation to the victims. And I also want to bring up reparations with regard to innocence. In our United States report, we address the right to reparations when somebody has been wrongfully convicted. Because when exonerees are released in the United States, they face a lot of challenges reintegrating into society. The right to compensation for wrongful imprisonment, however, varies widely from state to state in this country. So exonerees from different states are not guaranteed equivalent compensation. In fact, 16 retentionist US states do not have compensation laws for wrongfully convicted individuals. And in states that do have compensation laws, exonerees often must overcome onerous procedural and eligibility barriers. In some states, you have to show that DNA played a role in your exoneration. But when we look at the numbers, out of those 150 exonerations, DNA played a role in only 20 of them. If exonerees do ultimately succeed in their bid for compensation, the compensation they may receive can be meager, and they often fall short of the federal standards. And I also want to illustrate um, or talk about the children of death sentence persons. And here you see a list of the different kinds of issues the children and their families may face. I do want to describe the third point um, with an example I heard recently about children visiting their parents in the United States prisons. In this example, discrimination intersects with the children of sentenced persons, and that's probably how I would frame it in a UPR report. A friend who was visiting death row recently observed how a Latino family came in to visit their husband and their dad on death row. And the boy, the son, was wearing long shorts, but the guard gave him a lot of trouble about that and demanded to know his age. The boy was actually really young. He, he was under the age at which certain clothing restrictions come into effect, like long pants. 
But the prison administration didn't believe him, and they wouldn't let him go in and visit his dad because he was wearing long shorts. So this little boy sat outside for two hours crying while the rest of his family got to visit with his father. Yet my friend, the person who had witnessed all this, said she had also seen women who are white walk in wearing sandals, sleeveless shirts, and other pieces of clothing that break the prison rules, and they're still allowed to visit. So in this case, what I would do is I would take this direct observation and I would bring it in my UPR report as an example of racial discrimination and its impact on the children and the families of death sentenced persons. And finally, I want to end with kind of this last umbrella catch-all for all of the other practices that I haven't listed because it's not always predictable what tactics countries are going to use to punish their prisoners. I highlighted a number of different topics that can constitute cruel and inhuman treatment or punishment, like death row conditions, painful methods of execution, and so on. But you may be researching a country and find something totally new that I haven't mentioned but still fits as cruel and inhuman treatment or punishment. Case example. Japan has a peace of mind law to ensure that attention is paid to help the death row inmate maintain peace of mind. This is actually a pretext for imposing harsh conditions on the inmate, and in reality what it means is strict restrictions on communications with outside people, prolonged solitary confinement and strict restrictions on their movement, the monitoring of meetings between the inmates and their lawyers, denial of independent psychiatric evaluation and treatment, and censorship of their books and their letters. So finally, I want to end my portion of this training with some resources. And this is just a starting list of resources. Um, there may be many more out there that I haven't listed that are specific to your country. And sometimes a good Google search um, will show up, uh, bring up quite a few more. But these are um, some good sources for finding out more about the death penalty internationally as well as on your country. And it's always just good to check news sources as well and use your best judgment if you think it's credible. So now that we have some context about the various death penalty issues that you may encounter um, in working with your partner organizations, we thought it would be helpful if we took a closer look at recommendations. Um, and I'm a big fan as a former social studies teacher of primary sources, so we'll, we'll take a look at some primary sources from the Universal Periodic Review um, to, to, to look at some specific recommendations. Now, as Jennifer talked about the treaty body reviews and the treaty law is sort of a matter of consent. It's sort of international human rights world of contract law. If a country doesn't ratify a treaty, then it's not bound by the language of the treaty. And there's a similar contract law concept in the Universal Periodic Review. And that is, as I mentioned before, countries can make recommendations, but it's up to the country under review to accept or reject those recommendations. And actually, reject is too strong a word because in the United Nations, they don't call it rejecting recommendations. They call it noting the recommendations. So recommendations are either accepted or noted. Um, and when you're thinking about what recommendations to make or how to frame your recommendations, if, if you're into sort of institutional jargon and talking about goals and all of that, you may be familiar with this SMART mnemonic um, that goals or objectives should be specific, measurable, achievable, um, realistic and time bound. So those are sort of the magic ingredients for having a good measurable, you know, good goal if you're if you're setting goals or objectives. And you can think about these as being good quali good qualities of recommendations as well. You want a recommendation to be specific. You want to be able to measure it in the next UPR to determine whether that recommendation was in fact implemented. You want it to be achievable, something that a government can do in the course of four years. You want it to be realistic and that, you know, in, in the world of international National human rights is, of course, a big concern because if it's unrealistic, then chances are the government won't accept it. They will simply note it. And having it be time bound. Now, the UPR itself has its own time boundaries because it happens every four and a half years. So there's an Im implied um, time limit that if you accept a recommendation, you will implement it by the next review. Uh, so, so those are good qualities, the, the smart qualities for recommendations. But it's, you also have to keep in mind that it's, it's not 
not one institution, you have the political gloss on this. So that you, you may persuade a country to make a very smart recommendation, but that recommendation may in the end be simply noted rather than accepted. So it, it's sort of a balancing act that you have to engage in with your partner organizations and with the countries that you're doing the lobbying with as well. Uh, so I thought it would be helpful to take a look at some recommendations and if you picked up the paper clipped set that the first page where the first page is in French that's um, those are the examples of recommendations and these are all recommendations that were made in 2010 for the first universal periodic review of Iran and I have noted next to the recommendations whether they were accepted with an A or whether they were noted by the government of Iran and I think it's helpful to see what how the government of Iran responded to the different recommendations. I also think it's helpful to see how short the statements are. Each review of each country is three hours long and there's very limited time for each country to speak. They don't have time to make lengthy, detailed recommendations. They also need to insert all of their diplomatic speak. So the recommendations themselves are generally very brief, very succinct, and there's, there's, it's, it's another good thing to keep in mind as you're working on a stakeholder report is can you make a concise recommendation that sort of captures the gist of what you want the government to agree to. So if you look at the Belgian recommendation, if, if you don't read French, um, I translated on the back the two death penalty recommendations. The, I didn't translate it, I copied a translation. Um, the first recommendation that was accepted was for the government of Iran to respect at least the minimum standards and provisions of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the Convention on the Rights of the Child concerning the death penalty for as long as it is maintained. So in other words, Belgium said, as long as you're gonna have the death penalty, comply with the minimum standards under these two international human rights treaties. And the government of Iran uh, accepted that. Now, as Rose told you, the minimum standard for the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights is that the death penalty applies only to the most, uh, most what, what's the language, most serious crimes. And so Iran essentially agreed that it would impose it only for the most serious crimes. It may not have, Iran, the government of Iran may not have realized what it agreed to, but that's what it agreed to. That's the minimum standard in the ICCPR. And the Convention on the Rights of the Child says that you do not execute people for crimes they committed as juveniles. That's the minimum standard in the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and the Iranian government accepted that recommendation. So good on Belgium for pushing for that recommendation, and amazing that the government of Iran accepted that. Now, Four and a half years later, the government of Iran did not implement that recommendation, but it's still a great advocacy tool for human rights advocates working on Iran to say, look, in 2010, you agreed to this recommendation. You committed yourself to the world in front of all the governments of the world to do this. Now let's work on implementing this recommendation you accepted. Now, the recommendation that Belgium made that failed was introduce a moratorium on executions as soon as possible. You know, you can hope for that, but chances are the government of Iran or the government of the United States won't accept those recommendations. Doesn't mean that you don't make those or don't push for uh, governments to make them, but you just have to be realistic that it may not fly. The next um, set of recommendations, because it's in English, it might be a little bit easier. These are recommendations made by the government of Ireland. And you can see all of the diplomatic language. Um, and also bear in mind that the diplomats are not gonna speak probably exclusively on the death penalty. They may have other human rights issues they wanna raise in the one minute they have to speak. And it's it really, any government that wants to speak can sign up to speak during the UPR. And what they do is they take the three hours of time, they allow some breaks in time for the government to respond to the recommendations and questions, and then they just chop up all the time. So the shortest amount of time I have seen has been less than 60 seconds. There have been universal periodic reviews where countries get not, get um, 55 seconds to make their recommendations. The most I've seen is two minutes. But at any rate, they have very limited time and it's a situation where you pity the poor interpreters at the United Nations because you have diplomats who are trying to get through their statement. It's been vetted by their own government. These are the points they need to make. And they're sometimes going at breakneck speed to get in all those words before the buzzer sounds. And the interpreters have to try to keep up and they're amazingly skilled, but there is a lot of time pressure. So if you look at the uh, government of Ireland, they made several recommendations and one of them, you know, on, on four different topics, 
This person must have been speaking very quickly. And the recommendation they made was that Ireland, er, that Iran fully comply with its obligations under the ICCPR and the CRC. Now, very similar to Belgium's recommendation, but it was noted, not accepted. So you notice what Belgium said is, as long as you're going to have the death penalty, comply with the minimum standards. And um, Ireland's recommendation was a little bit more general, just comply with the ICCPR and the CRC. And Iran noted that one rather than accepting it. So it's, it's sort of an interesting, interesting to look at what this procedural background was, what happened with the last UPR. The next recommendations come from the government of Israel, and you can already anticipate that, there might, that, that those recommendations might not be warmly received by the government of Iran. Um, and the two death penalty related recommendations were noted by um, Iran to commute all death sentences um, and abolish public executions by hanging and stoning, issues Rose talked about, that was noted. And again, a very similar recommendation to the um, government of, of Belgium and to the um, government of Ireland to comply with obligations under the CRC and the ICCPR and prohibit executions who at their time of their offense were under the age of 18. Now, they agreed to do that with respect to the Belgian recommendation, but they simply noted it here. So again, it's, it's sort of a, a question of how specific the recommendation is. And um, so, so it's, it's, it's very interesting, the different choices in language for the recommendations and which succeed and which do not. And the last example I gave you is the uh, government of no New Zealand, which covered several different issues. But on the death penalty, the government of New Zealand focused on um, the death penalty for minors. Um, which was noted, not accepted, but they had success in with respect to which uh, offenses are eligible for the death penalty. And again, this is not a smart recommendation because it's not um, sort of specific, measurable, because New Zealand recommended that Iran reconsider the inclusion of apostasy, which Kraft and Heresy as capital offenses. Well, you can reconsider it and still include it. It's just a matter of, well, yeah, we thought about it, and we decided to keep those offenses in. But the government of Iran agreed to that, so they at least agreed to think about the issue, which is maybe the most you can hope for in some contexts. So that gives you sort of a little walkthrough of how different diplomats, different countries approach the recommendations and how you with partner organizations can think about how you want to strategically frame your recommendations. And I think it's a really good idea to think about the recommendations first before you get too deep into writing your report because you want the report to, to be the supporting information for the particular recommendations. So it's a good idea to have those conversations early on with your partner organization about what recommendations you want to target. Yeah, you may want to ask for them to abolish the death penalty, but what else can you play around with that would actually make a difference on the ground? So those are good, good things to think about and strategize about with your partner organizations. So with that little rundown of recommendations, we will go to question and answers. And I'll say that for those of you who are listening on the telephone and online, if you would like to pose a question, be sure to un unmute your mic and go ahead and ask a question. And Jennifer Rose and I will all take a stab. And if you're here in the room, of course, just raise your hand or chime in. But we'd be happy to, to answer more questions or give you more illustrations or clarifications of things we've covered. So thanks very much. I think we can email that out to everyone who registered. Yeah. Yeah. The question for those on the phone was whether or not we would make the PowerPoint available, and we can send that out. Do that. 
Uh, I'll summarize the question so that the people who are listening in um, can hear. And the gist of the question is, do the governments that make the recommendations, do they strategize and sort of set out the recommendations, sort of divvy up who's going to make the really strong recommendation that's likely to get shot down and who's going to make recommendations that are a little bit more softly worded? Um, do they all pool together? And those are things that are, are only known by the diplomats who actually engage in the, the sophisticated advocacy that happens at the United Nations Human Rights Council. Um, we do know that there are some countries, specifically on the death penalty, that do collaborate in the Human Rights Council on death penalty related matters. So it's quite possible that there is some strategizing or some conversations, but a lot of these conversations happen between the people who are in Geneva, actually the lower level diplomats on the ground in Geneva, and their equivalent of the State Department or their foreign office. So a lot of that gets negotiated within the country, and it's possible that the people in Geneva are also doing some side conversations. But uh, first and foremost, every word that gets spoken on the floor of the Human Rights Council by a diplomat is likely very highly vetted by the government that person works for. So I would, I would say that you know, in an ideal world, we as advocates could collaborate with all of the members of the Human Rights Council that are opposed to the death penalty, say, okay, we'd really like you to do this. We'd really like, pull them all together in a conference. But the reality is in terms of how we're able to do our advocacy, we, we don't have that, that much control over them. You know, we, we get our one-on-one -on -one meetings and we have conversations, but in the end they, in consultation with their governments, decide what they're going to say. I think I would, I agree. I would just add um, one thing, which is that um, very often the geopolitical stuff gets in the mix too. And so, you know, they definitely, countries definitely pay attention to what another country said about them. Um, and so, some that's we that's too deep for us to to go into but um it definitely does happen that there's a little bit of payback um and so in that sort of negotiation among like-minded countries um on death penalty issues which there's there are similar kinds of you know sort of um consortiums or collaborations on women's rights issues and uh you know there's there's a lot of, of grouping like that on, on various human rights issues, but um, but I would suspect that there within those negotiations, there's a little bit of well, we'll we want to say this because of what that country said about us on a, another issue four years ago. Any other any other questions? Okay, thank you so much. And um, if you're interested in doing any of these UPR submissions, I know we have a couple of current volunteers in the room who are working on these UN submissions, but if you're interested, um, come up and talk with us afterward and we can chat about possibilities. Thank you. And, and I'll also add for the people listening on the phone, if you wanna follow up with us via email with questions, we'd be happy to do that as well. It might be easier to do, to do follow up via email. We welcome, welcome you to reach out to us. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.